puffballs. I first saw her from the bedroom window. She was wearing Wellington boots and a shiny new wax jacket. Her bright red and pink harem pants weren't the usual attire for hikers. Her burnt orange coloured hair was piled into a loose and low chignon that spilt onto her shoulders. I could see she was attractive, but since she didn't pay it any attention, like a brightly coloured butterfly settled on an ordinary leaf. An arthritic Labrador dog lagged behind her. I watched her stroll across the wet grass meadow, stop for the dog to relieve himself and then wait while he sniffed at the left behind scents of fox and badger. I thought she was probably staying in one of the village holiday lets, a city dweller up from London for a long weekend. She fell into a regular pattern of morning and afternoon walks, following the footpath that ran the length of my cottage garden. My work desk was set below the bedroom window, so I rarely missed her excursions. I noticed her picking wild field mushrooms into a small netted bag. In the right conditions, they thrived in the lengthening September shadows. On the fourth afternoon, she looked up at me and smiled. Embarrassed to have been noticed, I smiled back and lifted a hand. Although exercising the dog had fallen into a routine for her, it became something of a disturbance for me. My concentration on the computer became diverted by any dog walker that might have been her. On the fifth day, I resolved to be outside to set the stage for a chance meeting. At nine o'clock, I began to collect fallen twigs from underneath the beach that stretched over the footpath. I tell her I was hoarding kindling for the wood burner. By quarter past, she still hadn't walked up the footpath. By half past, I'd picked the lawn clean of everything. Back at my work desk, I was restless and distracted. I made endless cups of tea. From the kitchen window, I could see the footpath where it crossed in front of the garden gate. That afternoon, I went outside again. This time I found secateurs and began chopping at the roses. I'd nearly given up when she came into view, crossing the meadow. She must have walked the circular route in the opposite direction. I chose my moment to break off from the dead heading and ambled into the footpath. I squatted and stroked her dog. Hello, you're a lovely old lad, aren't you? I said, ruffling the dog's ears. What's his name? Toffee, she said. He hasn't been well. His poor old legs. I thought she was mid-forties, maybe make, making me ten years older. Her only makeup was some pale pink lip gloss. Her hair was swirled into the same loose bun that seemed both coiffured and quickly constructed, as though in the morning after something formal. Her voice was soft, with a faint Mediterranean accent. Italian or Spanish. You're a new face, I said. Here on holiday? I'm Peter, by the way. No, we've moved here short term. We're renting Parsley Cottage. I'm B. Parsley Cottage was half a mile away. Years ago it had been the village shop and post office. We, as in you and Toffee, and Greg, my husband, but he spends most of his time in London or abroad. I'm meant to be house hunting. Sorry, I'm being nosy. No, you're the first person who's spoken to me. What about you, been here long? 10 years, live alone. My grown up daughter drops in occasionally. How are you finding it? Peaceful, good for mushrooms. I suppose that's why I came, I said the quiet. It was at that point that Toffee collapsed to the ground as though settling down to sleep on the muddy footpath. Oh no, I'll never be able to get him up again, she said. I've walked him too far. She tried coaxing him back to his feet but he wasn't going anywhere. Shall I get my car? We can lift him into the back. I'll drive you home. Would you mind? I'm so sorry to trouble you like this. I managed to lift the old dog from my car into Parsley Cottage. 
as B held the door. She pointed to his basket in the kitchen. He'll get up eventually, she said. Greg says he'll make the hard decision when Toffee doesn't get up. While she made coffee, I told B what I did. A self-employed accountant, small businesses mainly, something I could do from home. I came to the village after my wife left. She told me Greg was a foreign correspondent for a national newspaper, that she was his second wife and that she met him in Dubrovnik during the Yugoslav Wars. He was the intrepid reporter. She was the young translator. We're a living, breathing cliché, she said. They owned a flat in central London, but her husband dreamt of reliving his childhood in the English countryside. I'm lonely in London. Even lonelier here, B said. There's not a lot happening. Will you find work? Greg is against it. He says Toffee will keep me company while he's away. I let a few days go by without talking again to B. I made sure I was at my desk at the time she took Toffee for his walks, much shorter now, up the footpath, across the meadow and back. I willed the dog to collapse again, but he limped on. We waved at each other sometimes. I began to wonder what I was doing in that grim cottage. It hadn't been decorated since the 80s. It was cold and damp in the winter. Mine was a solitary, silent non-existence. I'd been to Dubrovnik, to Croatia. Who'd want to live in some dreary English backwater? At the end of the second restless week, I pulled on my boots and waited for her on the footpath. Mind if I join you for some fresh air? Please do, you'll be the first person I've spoken to in days. Not even your husband. Strictly text only when Greg's at work. Those are my orders. After that, I walked with B and Toffee two or three times a week. I wished then that Toffee had been a young pup, able to walk for miles. I often thought about asking B out for lunch or in for supper but I was afraid of spoiling something. The last day I saw her properly, she was walking down the path with what looked like a white football under her arm. I went out to meet her. A giant puffball, she said. I've heard about them, but never found or eaten one. I'm told they're delicious. Had breakfast? She came into my home for the first time and sat at the kitchen table while I sliced up the puffball and fried it. Neither of us had eaten with another human being for weeks. We sat and recounted our life stories till lunchtime when B said she had to go. Greg's booked a call to discuss progress on the house hunting, she told me. I haven't even been trying. I hope you'll stay in the area, I said. What would I do without Toffee? When she left, she held both my hands and kissed me. I felt short of breath for the remainder of the day and couldn't work. I sat for hours at the kitchen table dreaming up impossible plans. She knocked on the door early the next morning. He wants me back in London, she said. I'll be catching the afternoon train. When will you be back? I asked. When he says, I suppose. I took to following her steps up the footpath and across the meadow as though retracing her route would somehow bring her back. Puffballs don't last that long. They dehydrate, discolour and shrivel. If you hit them with a stick, they explode into clouds of green smoke. I think that's the spores drifting off to germinate somewhere else.